Hey guys, you're listening to the Macro Trading Floor. This episode is brought to you by Wisdom Tree Europe. Wisdom Tree is a global ETF and ETP sponsor and asset manager founded in 2006 and with a track record of innovation and creating better ways to invest. Today, Wisdom Tree offers a broad range of differentiated ETFs and ETPs across equities, thematics, commodities, fixed income, currencies, short, leveraged, cryptocurrencies with over 80 billion in assets under management. For more information about Wisdom Tree, you can visit wisdomtree.eu. So guys, um, look, it's the 5th of January 2023, and there were two relatively important headlines to start the year, actually three maybe. But let's talk them one by one through Andreas. The first is the Fed Minutes. And... Um, in order to summarize what the content of the Fed Minutes was, I need to get back to a tweet uh, that I sent yesterday. There it is. Fed Minute Summary. Don't fuck around with us by pushing ARK, shitcoins, and the Nasdaq to the moon, or we and my friends, this is Jay Powell speaking, will have to hike Fed funds rate to 8 freaking percent. Thank you very much. Andreas, what do you make of the summary of the Fed Minutes by Alf? I've been saying for a while that... Um you need to watch financial conditions in, in, in a broad sense to gauge whether the Fed is done or not. Um, and the issue for the Fed is still that if they allow just a bit of a sort of feeling or um, how do you say it? I mean, if the market is able to just sniff out that they're close to this point, then they will lose the battle. Um, and therefore, it's important to stay very firm in the rhetoric, even very close to the point where they're actually consider pausing, right? Uh, I saw a lot of people commenting that it was kind of hilarious that the minutes deliberately stated that none of the members consider rate cuts in the second half of the year, given the market pricing. And as I responded to all of them asking me that question, um, well... Try, try telling the market that you're going to hike in the next three meetings or whatever, and then cut interest rates in the second half of the year. That would net-net be a material easing of financial conditions without any doubt. So obviously you cannot say that until you're very, very close to the point of actually pivoting. Um, so my best guess is that they will try again over the course of Q1 to remain firm, try to uh, bring down risk taking, try to bring down equities, and then they can consider it a done deal once they've actually managed that. Well, Andreas, the thing that uh, really interests me is that the Fed has been telling people what to do or how do they want them to lean in terms of positioning for now, I think, almost a year, very loudly. Every time we get an attempt at fighting the Fed, you always get stopped out, basically. And this time they also managed, because look at market reaction. The dollar is up, real rates are higher, the curve is flattening like a stone. That's also an interesting thing, where the front end is obviously the highest beta reaction to any messaging from the Federal Reserve when it comes to where the terminal rate should be, for how long it should be that high. Front end tends to react further. But the back end has been, again, flattened back very aggressively, so the market has strongly made up their mind that the more they push now, the worse it will be for economic conditions down the road, and therefore the curve flattens. You have, apparently the Fed still has quite some, some power, I think, in stopping out people that uh, they're going uh, against the Fed when it comes to, um, to the prescription of the FOMC, which is, please don't push us or we'll have to stop you out. Yeah, and remember that during this first quarter, we will see a liquidity addition from the U.S. Treasury due to the looming debt ceiling deadline. Uh, and given the turbulence in, in Congress right now, by the time we record this, they cannot even choose a speaker. Right? Uh, sure. I mean, it's, it's very evident that we are far away from any um, political situation that will increase the debt ceiling. And as long as that doesn't happen, the U.S. Treasury mechanically will have to bring down the level of the Treasury General account, uh, adding liquidity. And I think Jay Powell is well aware of this and the potential positive spillovers to equities from this. And therefore, he wants to sound extra firm due to this. Uh, so this is something that could add to Jay Powell's rhetoric. Yes. 
that and as well the fact that there's going to be a window where real incomes in the U.S. are not going to drop very hard anymore. So a slowing down of headline inflation uh, that is already in the making and given commodity price behavior is likely to be further in the making when it comes to headline inflation. While the labor market doesn't uh, slow down super aggressively yet, means that probably nominal uh, real incomes and real wages are likely to temporarily get a rebound. So the combination of slightly stronger real incomes for the first quarter and, as you said, the Treasury general account being spent down by the Treasury might act actually act as tailwinds for real growth in the equity markets, definitely not what the Federal Reserve wants. So, I mean, again, you can. this is interesting because you can make the argument, yes, I mean, because of that, I want to be long risk assets here. And the answer is, yes, in principle, you're right, but there is somebody bigger than you that is trying to tell you not to do that or is going to stop you out. And the guy has an infinite balance sheet. He can accelerate QT on the way down if he wants to. He can hike terminal rates uh, to higher levels if he wants to. So I never suggest pissing against the wind is a great strategy. And uh, that, that was a reminder in the Fed minutes. I've had a look at inflation data relative to the market pricing of central banks, or rather the quote-unquote reaction function of central banks in modern history. And <clears throat> as far as I can see, the lag between actual inflation and the central bank response has never been longer than right now. I think the reason is that the Fed deliberately said that they want to see actual data. They've almost acknowledged how crappy they are at forecasting. <laughs> so, and, and I mean, they cannot rely on forecasts showing inflation below 2% because if they're wrong, they will be ridiculed even more than they were on the way up. Um, and, and therefore, on my forward-looking indicators, and it holds for both Europe and the US now, we actually have a pretty clear picture of disinflation. But in any case, the central banks, they want to see it. They want to see it. Um, they cannot rely on a couple of double axis charts that I've made. <laughs> Obviously not. But Andreas, that also explains why the curves keep flattening, I think, because never like a, with this um, conjunction of events, you're going to have central banks being super late to the party. And actually, if you get the European Central Bank or the Bank of Japan, they'll be the, the, the latest they can ever be, right? They, they will re, be even reacting and enhancing their hawkish reaction function at the very end of um, the spike in inflation, what that does is that it just flattens out the curve because you cannot price it in at the front end. They'll simply deny you from doing that. And the only release valve will be pricing it in via a flatter yield curve. I think you have a call for two stands in Germany to, to be what, minus 200 basis point or whatever you talked about last time. Yeah, but I, I mean, I, I, I still think it's, it's a decently feasible scenario. Um, if you if you look at the reaction function of the European European Central Bank, it's even worse than the Fed, right? Yeah. Um, so right now we have clear disinflation trends in Spain, and I consider Spain a leading indicator of European aggregate inflation pressures, due to the fact that Spain is able to sort of push through energy costs quicker than peers in the eurozone. So I've I've taken a look at the response time from actual traded prices of energy onto the CPI in various countries. Spain is by far the swiftest, and we see a clear disinflation trend in Spain. And th I think that should spill over to Europe within a time frame of, say, two to three months. But if you look at the forward pricing, say, one year, one year Vester or Ionia, um, it lacks in between two and three months more than <laughs> the European aggregate inflation relative to Spain. So from the point where Spain disinflates to the point where the ECB will actually acknowledge it, it may take even up to half a year. Um, so that, 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 that leads me to say that the peak ECB hawkishness will arrive somewhere in Q2. I agree. And also the thing is they've just done a massive, super convincing hawkish pivot with Lagarde's last press conference, which means they've probably decided internally to go for it and be more hawkish and reprice terminal rates higher, actually. Um, if nominal inflation slows down in Europe, which it should, given uh, what commodity prices have, have done, food prices and other uh, things you have acknowledged as well in your work, they will be focusing on core inflation, Andreas. Very simple. They'll be saying, yeah, yeah, headline is coming down, but, uh, you know, look at core inflation is above 5%. And, uh, you know, for that to come down, we need to 
uh, hit the services sector. They're not going to say this, but that's the truth. We need to hit the services sector. We need the uh, labor market to slow down, etc. So basically exactly what the Fed has been telling you between July and December last year, the ECB is going to tell you between June and uh, January and June this year. This is how I see it. And what this is going to end up doing is it's going to pin front-end European yields pretty high. Actually, in my opinion, also cause some troubles in, in Italy and other weaker links within the Eurozone and flatten the yield curve very aggressively. So I guess, yeah, again, back to the actionable idea. The safest bet here is just to flatten the yield curve if you're not interested in an outright short position in the very front end, because I think it can be price highest though. But um, in any case... In any case, one, one thing that adds to this, and maybe we should discuss that briefly before bringing on the guest um, to the show, is China. I mean, it's, an, it's on everybody's lips as, as a consequence of this reopening plan for 8th of Jan. Um, what do you make of it, Alf? Well, I think it's uh, sitting in both my European and US portfolios, so I'm pretty happy about that. No, it, it was a position that... Um, I think it still has legs to go over the next one to three months. Uh, the reason is there's going to be bumps down the road. I mean, obviously, it's the reopening of the second largest economy in the world. They're going to have to stop at some point because of cases and hospitalizations or whatever, although the social incentive schemes in China are probably a bit different than the Western economies. So also there, I wouldn't really look at the roadmap of US and Europe to say it's going to be one-on-one. -on -one. But even with the start and stops, Andreas, I mean, in 2022, China tried to print and did so some real economy money that couldn't be spent not in major size but still couldn't be spent because people were stuck at home so you have additional excess real economy spendable deposits from people consumers and on top of it you're literally reopening the entire economy so um the, the way i see it is it it will take a while before it's fully priced in also don't forget emerging market asset allocators last year they couldn't touch china Forget about China. Real estate crisis, credit couldn't be touched, equities couldn't be touched. No money was flowing to China, literally, uh, last year. Where it was flowing, it's Brazil, it's Mexico, it's Latin America, if you were an emerging market manager. Now, this year, you might want to allocate back to China some of the money that has been allocated in Latin America or other places in Asia, and it's going to take some time before it gets done. So I still like sitting on this position as part of an ETF portfolio. Yeah, and... Ultimately, by the end of the day, you will see this showing up in South Korean data before anywhere else. So that's essentially what you need to watch. And you need to watch the Korean one because that's also a bellwether for global trade. And if the Korean one starts moving in a positive direction, it is something you need to note also for your equity portfolio. Before we move to the guest of the show, let me just briefly mention that there is one equity sector uh, negatively correlated to the CPI. So when the CPI drops, it performs and positively correlated to China. That is healthcare. It's part of that uh, conservative defensive equity category that generally performs well in a slowing nominal growth environment. The correlation with China was not on my radar, uh, so I'll have to look at, at it, but it's a good point. Now, enough blubbering from our end, Andreas. Why don't we call somebody that can tell us what's going on in commodities, which is a very hot market, or it was in 2022, but why don't we talk about it as we start 2023 as well? Let's bring the guest on the show. It is now our great pleasure to introduce the guest of the week at the macro trading floor. We have Nitesh Shah with us today, the head of commodity and macroeconomics research at our Friends of Wisdom Tree Europe. So great to see you, Nitesh. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Hey, Nitesh. Pleasure for uh, us to host you. So let's go into it. And as we always uh, ask, the first question is a pretty general one, which is um, your expertise relies in commodities. So why don't you tie a bit the macro outlook into the commodities outlook to start 2023? Absolutely. And maybe, you know, a good starting point is just to reflect back on where we came from. Um, you know, 2022 was uh, a strong year for, for, for commodities, um, yet most of the asset classes uh, were struggling. Um, it was in the year where um, central banks had started to raise interest rates uh, quite aggressively. Uh, so equities, bonds, real estate, cryptocurrencies, all the major other asset classes posted negative returns, whereas commodities were double-digit strong returns, plus 16%. If you look at the Bloomberg Commodity Index, 
Um, and a lot of that came from energy, um, having fallen in sort of 2020 and going in a sharp recovery. Um, the war in Ukraine was something that propelled uh, energy uh, even more, added a second layer of, of, of catalyst uh, to, to that. And also a number of other commodities that were you know, highly produced in the Ukraine-Russia region, but also that are reliant on energy as an input for their uh, production. So we're coming to 2023, and um, <clears throat> there are some uh, clouds out there. Um, one, you know, the um, the fears of economic slowdown that have been hurting other asset classes have already started to affect uh, commodities, and we've seen in the second half of 2022 coming into 2023, um, you know, some uh, pullback in, in in commodity prices. However. Um, we believe that commodities will probably uh, end the year higher. Um, one of the things that was absent in 2022 was the participation of China. Uh, China with the zero COVID policies, and bearing in mind China is the largest consumer of all commodities in the world, um, with zero COVID policies, its economy was completely, very uh, severely restrained in, in, in the past couple of years. Um, that has now been sort of unleashed. Uh, a lot of its uh, COVID, zero COVID policies are being dismantled. Uh, unfortunately, in the, in the sh- very short term, what it means is that COVID cases are rising, rising rapidly. Uh, that could hurt economic growth in the very short term in, in China. But once you get over this bump, uh, then uh, demand for a lot of uh, commodities from China will, will accelerate. That will act as a counterbalance to some of the uh, slowing growth that, that we see uh, elsewhere, um, bearing in mind that most developed world central banks are hell bent right now on uh, killing inflation, and that could mean that they raise rates too much, uh, and, uh, and and therefore economic growth hurts. But um, once we get through that that bump, uh, we believe that commodity commodity prices and commodity demand will accelerate. Interesting that you bring up the Chinese reopening already early in this discussion because we had poor numbers out of China. Um, was it a couple of days ago from the PMI out of China? Uh, it kind of showed up in energy price action immediately with a very negative start to the year for energy. Uh, but if we look at China and the relation to the commodity complex, the commodity complex is obviously broad and diverse, which subsectors beneath the surface of the commodity complex would gain from such reopening, in your view? Well, energy is a a clear area where we we can see a lot of growth. I mean, um, you know, economic growth is is almost translating energy into uh, production and uh, you know uh, getting these sort of values out out of out of that, and with um, so many cities being used to you know periodic shutdowns, uh, manufacturing activity uh, being uh, being cut off um, uh, as a result of the uh, zero COVID policies of, of prior years, um, with that going away, um, you get a lot more smoother production going on uh, going forward, and. Um, Therefore, energy demand is likely to increase. But with energy, um, there, there's a lot more of a complex story there. Um, you know, crude oil, um, which is you know one of the largest components of the energy complex, um, that is uh, the production of crude oil is about 45 percent controlled by OPEC and its partner countries. Uh, that's a significant amount. And what OPEC has been doing in uh, recent months has been laying the groundwork for further production cuts. Um, if you look at their demand forecasts for oil, they look a lot weaker than any other forecasting agency, whether you look at the uh, International Energy Agency that, or the Energy, Administ- uh, Energy Information Administration or any other large uh, forecaster out there. And the reason behind that is OPEC want to keep oil prices hovering around that ninety dollars a barrel. Um, it's not just uh, Western, uh, you know, developed world countries that are suffering from high inflation rates. Um, most OPEC nations are suffering from high inflation rates, and with most OPEC countries that have a high spending obligation, and you know, governments reliant on oil revenues to meet those spending obligations. 
they need to keep oil prices at a certain level to keep to keep spending uh, at the levels that they used to. So we believe that OPEC are positioning for another cut uh, or, or in terms of production, and therefore that should push current prices up to that sort of ninety dollar uh, per barrel region, despite the fact that we've had um, a slide in prices over the last few days. Nitesh, I need to ask you now a question on something that I noticed uh, to be an inconsistency in the commodity market um, of late. You have the Chinese reopening that is being repriced in um, Chinese renminbi, in Chinese equities. You might want to argue in Australian dollar, in uh, maybe in the Korean won as well. So in multiple places. Um, but you're having gold outperforming oil uh, pretty aggressively which is normally not really what you would expect from a correlation basis when you have such a, a cyclical nominal growth booster like the reopening of the second largest economy in the world. So how do you explain short term, at least this divergence? Yeah, um, gold is quite a uh, complex asset. Um, you know, it's arguable whether you call it a commodity or a, uh, you know, some sort of pseudo currency. And uh, in that light, we've actually developed a model for uh, looking at gold prices. And uh, the motivation there was, you know, there's so many things that people talk about that move gold prices. We thought if we can collect as many of those variables in, in time series basis and uh, model it out in, in, in a multivariate basis so that we can exclude the variables that have the least, um, you know, uh, meaningful impact on, on prices. And by doing that, we can come up with a very parsimonious uh, kind of uh, explanation for what moves gold prices. And they're primarily Inflation rates, um, treasury yields. Um, so as treasury yields rise, i.e. when bond prices fall, uh, gold prices also fall, they're competing anti-fragile assets. Um, uh, also the dollar exchange rate. So as the dollar appreciates, that tends to be uh, negative of gold prices in dollar terms. And the last thing is investor sentiment towards gold. And what we've been seeing uh, recently in the last few weeks um, has been some of the big headwinds uh, for gold, uh, i.e. the strong dollar and um, the bond sell-off has kind of gone into reverse, right? You're starting to see dollar depreciation and uh, bond uh, bond yields have started to decline. That's really helped gold prices actually rise over the last uh, few, few weeks. Uh, but on top of that, investor sentiment towards the metals actually improved as well. So if you look at speculative positioning uh, in gold futures, um, they had dipped quite low um, in that sort of June to um, October period of, of last year, but uh, come November and December and going into into the beginning part of this year, we're seeing uh, speculative positioning in gold futures uh, mm -hmm. rise, and they were sort of just above uh, historic normal levels right now. Um, why has gold sentiment, uh, you know, improved? Um, possibly the fact that. We're still going into another year of uncertainty. We don't, you know, there's lots, lots of fears in the market that central banks are still likely to overdo it. I mean, if you look at the Fed's uh, discussion yesterday, they were sort of discussing the market, how misinterpreted them. They, they, they think that they, you know, that inflation is still going to remain stubbornly high and they're going to raise rates a lot more than the market expects. People are buying gold as a, as a defensive hedge against um, other aspects of the portfolio. I I wanted to get your take on the demand for oil when we put together a Chinese reopening with a quite evident slowdown in the Western economies. Uh, so if we look at the supply side, it looks tight. And you also made your remarks related to OPEC's uh, supply in the coming quarters. But what about the demand side if you add a Chinese reopening with a slowdown in Europe? Yeah, uh, so, you know, Europe, large parts of Europe will be in, in, in recession, um, you know, in, in the beginning half of this year. Um, you know, that doesn't bode well for, for oil demand from the European region. But if you think about where's the, um, big growth drivers of, of oil historically, um, you know, Europe is not really, you know, the, the, the big place to look at, right? So, um, you know, in, in fact, you know, manufacturing activity in Europe has been on a, a slow decline, uh, for, for, for several decades. So that, that growth component for, uh, for energy has been somewhat, somewhat lower. Uh, but also, you know, bear in mind that, you know, we've had this uh, systemic shock in, in Europe. 
um, you know, with the Ukrainian war. So a lot of the energy that they had been sourcing from uh, Russia, uh, that's largely out of bounds at, at this point in time. So Europe is still trying to catch up and find energy resources from elsewhere uh, in, in the world. Um, and so he's fighting for the same barrels of oil, those uh, same cargoes of liquefied natural gas that uh, Asia and other places are looking for. So demand, um, even though it may fall, the supply problem is just that the more, uh, you know, uh, you know, much more of a, of a problem at this moment in, in, in time. And with China reopening, and as I said, there is going to be a lot of volatility and bumps in the roads as uh, COVID cases rise right now. Uh, but as uh, the demand picks up from from, from China, uh, that's going to become a very, uh, you know, that's going to become a crunch point because um, that fight for the same barrel of oil uh, is going to be that much more aggressive. Now, the G7's, um, uh, you know, cap that they're trying to implement on uh, on Russian barrels of oil, I think that's a very tricky thing to administer, right? Um, you know, European uh, countries don't really consume Russian uh, barrels at, the, at this point anyway. Um, so what they're trying to do is to implement these uh, policies in an extraterritorial manner. Uh, so the Chinese companies that are importing Russian barrels of oil uh, will no longer have the insurance uh, and the infrastructure uh, support uh, from Europe. I just don't think that's going to be enough to really deter uh, China from, from, from using the, 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 those cheaper Russian barrels. Um, so I'm not saying that, you know, those, those barrels are going to go completely go outside of the market. They still probably will go to China, but it'll just become more tricky to actually uh, get these into the market. But there is going to be a lot much more uh, tightness as a result of some of those policies. This episode is brought to you by Curve. Curve is a payments card company that empowers customers to control, maintain, and direct total control into their finances. By using Curve and adding your other cards to Curve's wallet, you unlock new value like cash flow management, self-driving money, and the ability to stack rewards. Guys, basically think of Curve like one unique credit card that helps you maximize your rewards. Rather than add another card to your wallet, Curve instead combines all your cards into one. It effectively helps you maximize your rewards. You also earn a 1% cashback on everything that you buy between now and the next six months. It is also useful to get on top of your cash flows by consolidating multiple credit cards into one single place. You are eligible to receive $20 in Curve Cash to your Curve account within 14 days of you downloading the Curve app through the referral link in the description list of the podcast and making your first transaction. So if you want to get your $20 in cash back, the referral link is in the description below the video. And Nitesh, we are talking about short to medium term macro <laughs> implication within the commodity space. But what about the medium to long term implication for the commodity space? Because we are hearing about um, net zero emissions, green transitions and all these pretty big changes when it comes to long term commodity complex. So can I get your take on this uh, medium to long term implications for the commodity markets as a whole, go from industrial metals to other commodities? Yeah, and I think this is where, um, you know, we're going to see some really big game changes in, in the commodity complex. Uh, we've been talking for a number of years about, um, how this energy transition, so the movement away from, uh, consumption of hydrocarbons towards uh, more renewable, uh, sources of energy and all the infrastructure and the enablers of that, um, will progress. Um, and, um, we, right now we're seeing an acceleration of the energy transition, partly driven by the, by, by that war in, in Ukraine with the European Union trying to wean itself off, uh, Russian hydrocarbon dependency. And the best way to do that is through, uh, renewables and, uh, and the battery technologies that, uh, uh support renewables. Um, pr the primary beneficiary of, of that movement will be uh, metals, um, metals are required for, uh, improving the infrastructure. So for the electrification, so distribution and, um, transmission cabling requires a lot more copper. Um, batteries that are needed to harness the quite volatile, uh, production of renewables. Think about wind or solar, you know, where uh, they can be, uh, you know, 
we can have very windy days or very uh, calm days or very sunny days or very dull days. The, the, the fluctuation in those natural uh, components are, are really uh, quite wide. And you need battery technology to harness the power when you have excess and release it when there's less. So um, the, those kinds of technologies require lots of uh, base metals. Nickel is uh, one of the key things that is used in, uh, in, in, in lithium mine batteries. Um, and um, what we see is there's a massive gap right now between the climate goals uh, that are being signed up for, uh, which are legally binding international treaties uh, by, uh, by the, the large, and what policies are in place right now. There's going to be a massive catch up. So the demand for all these metals will, will rise substantially. Um, unfortunately, the supply of many metals is uh, very tight already. Uh, most base metals are already in a supply deficit. So what I mean by that is the annual production of them is less than the annual demand. So we're eating up above ground inventory. And, you know, it's hard to get best good measures of total inventory. But if you look at what's held on uh, futures exchanges, for example, um, they're going down to wafer thin levels already. So um, what we see is there's a potential, you know, potentially a very, very large uh, increase in, in metal prices down the road. Um, uh, so markets are already quite tight. A lot of metal curves are already in a place of um, uh, backwardation. And uh, backwardation does indicate tightness. Uh, what I mean by backwardation is, you know, the front month prices are higher than prices later on. Usually that only occurs when people are desperate to get hold of those metals. Um, so um, what we see is the energy transition is very strong, but also added to that, we've got this infrastructure uh, renaissance going on. Um, in the COVID period, there was lots of fiscal firepower looking for a home, and where where else to plug, uh, you know, a hole is in is infrastructure where you know most developed countries haven't been spending enough on infrastructure. We've had the U.S., uh, you know, uh, if, you know, uh, approve an infrastructure bill. The European Union's been spending a lot on infrastructure, um, and you added to that, you've got the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, all of these things are, you know, very, very strong in terms of infrastructure spending. And that's going to be also quite metal intensive as well. So, uh, we believe commodities are, are actually in a super cycle. Right now, the business cycle dynamics, um, you know, with the re recession on the horizon is holding back commodities. But once the, we're out of this business cycle phase, uh, we could be in for a, you know, a multi-decade period of commodity uh, strength. Nitesh, any uh, particular view, coming back a bit to the short term, any particular view on uh, the Russia-Ukraine story? As in, obviously, you need to be a, a geopolitical strategist to answer these questions nowadays, but the impact on commodity and the broader global macro markets is obviously extremely large. So I need to ask this question. Absolutely. So, um, the, you know, the Russia-Ukraine situation, I mean, I can't predict when the war will end. Um, it doesn't really look like there is um in, in near term catalyst to to end uh, in, in that war uh so for for right now my working assumption is that um the the barrels of oil that russia produces is you know largely off off uh, off the market for um you know the g7 countries their ability to impose uh their restrictions uh, extraterritorially is going to be uh you know very very difficult um and therefore i think that um uh Brent, uh, WTI, they're definitely going to be, uh, in, in, you know, uh, strong, in, they're going to they're definitely have a strong investment case, uh, going forward because of the tightness in those markets. But as I mentioned earlier on, um, there is that extra layer of geo geopolitical dynamics to that because of the OPEC, uh, cartel. And the OPEC cartel, you know, when you look at OPEC plus, that involves Russia. Um, and Russia has a seat at the table. Usually, uh, there is a lot of, uh, pre-meeting discussions between Saudi Arabia and Russia on how to position uh, the, the market. And uh, it's always in Russia's uh, uh, you know, favor that uh, OPEC keep the market relatively tight to keep prices high. Um, you know, you have to put it into context that even though Russia is uh, being shunned from the market right now, because of the price increase in oil, its oil revenues uh, are almost as high as they were prior to the war, right? If not higher. So, um, you know, keeping oil prices high is in the whole of OPEC's uh, benefit. 
but also importantly to Russia as well. So, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, thinking about how it plays out into a sort of an investment, I think oil prices, um, you know, offering where they are sub eighty dollars a barrel right now, um, it isn't sustainable. Um, if OPEC uh, have their way, it should go into the sort of nineties. If we sum it all up, um, a Chinese reopening on the cards, probably with a few hiccups short term, a kind of a frozen conflict in Russia uh, slash Ukraine, and a potential recession around the corner in the West. That mixture, what, where does that leave you from a risk reward perspective when it comes to the commodity complex? Yeah. Um... So from a risk reward uh, standpoint, um, you know, it's worth looking at, you know, what are the alternatives, right? Uh, thinking about this sort of the equity space, um, we've already seen in 2022 commodities outperform, uh, equities and bonds. Um, and we should remember that the, you know, the, 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 the correlation between commodities and equities remains, uh, relatively low, uh, and it has a, you know, a relatively, uh, smaller beta. So, um, you know, in periods of economic downturn, which we're likely to face in the beginning part of this year, I expect, um, the, you know, the equity markets to suffer a, a, a lot more than, uh, than the commodity markets. Um, but what could, um, you know, help commodity, what could, what could help global growth in general, uh, equity and commodity markets included, I think could be uh, more than disproportionately uh, beneficial to the uh, commodity markets, just given that it's the size of, uh, you know, the importance of, of China to the commodity complex in terms of demand. Um, and the supply picture just hasn't changed. You know, there's that, that, that significant level of cautiousness uh, amongst uh, resource extractors in terms of investing in new production. And that will leave markets significantly tighter, not just in the tail end of 2020, you know, second half of 2023, but going into 2024, 2025. That's a story that will be, remain uh, very positive for the, for the commodity markets. Um, so I think, uh, from, from a risk reward standpoint, I think, you know, that there is a, probably a lot more benefit in, uh, you know, having some sort of allocation into, into commodities. Um, and commodities have always been a very strong diversifier to a portfolio. Um, it's low, as I mentioned, low correlation to other asset classes, uh, means that it, it, it provides, uh, you know, new behavioral traits into, into a portfolio. And, uh, it, and obviously it has that enhanced, uh, uh, diversification benefit. Mitesh, you know, it's been a pleasure to hear you discuss all the corners of the commodity markets from precious metals to industrial commodities, from short term to long term. But the show is called the Macro Trading Floor. So at minutes 25, I am forced to ask you for what's the applicable macro trade idea for the next three to six months that you want to propose to our listeners based on your medium term macro outlook. Yeah. So it's, it's quite uh, simple, really. Um, I would uh, propose both uh, Brent and WTI uh, crude oil. Uh, they are, uh, you know, uh, you know, both the different blends of, 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 of oil. Um, and, you know, given the backdrop that I just dis described with, uh, OPEC likely making interventions, uh, supply remaining quite tight. And obviously the price decreases that we've just recently seen, uh, they are likely to, you know, propel in, in, in the, in that three to six month horizon. Um, possibly Brent, uh, has a slightly higher edge over WTI, just being a more sort of globally, uh, relevant, uh, benchmark. Um, and obviously with the China reopening trade kind of, uh, benefits, uh, Brent is slightly more than WTI, but they're both, uh, should be have a, should have a very high correlation to each other. Mitesh, we always allow our guests an early exit option. What could go wrong with the suggested trade? And I may sneak in a question, uh, in relation to your trade. Yeah. Let's suppose that the Chinese reopening is a great success for the Chinese authorities. Could they then be tempted to copy paste Joe Biden's strategy and empty their strategic petroleum reserve as a consequence of that reopening? Could that wrong foot your trade? I mean, I think any, um, you know, withdrawal of, uh, of oil from the, uh, from the SPR, uh, would be done in the context of 
huge strength in demand, right? Um, and, um, you know, that, you know, obviously withdrawing, putting something into, into the supply complex could, uh, help, you know, increase the supply and, and, you know, cap the price on, on the upside. I uh, can see capping on the price there, but I don't think they'll outright look to, um, bring prices lower. Um, that would be a, um, you know, it would be a, a bit of a bizarre policy move unless they are looking to massively propel their, uh, you know, their, their manufacturing industry. And I think at this point in time, we've, you know, what we have observed in other countries is that opening uh, activity up at a fairly measured pace uh, makes it better, uh, more sense than rapidly trying to open something up because you get, um, lots of bottlenecks uh, going on if, if you try to open up things too quickly. Um, and, um, you know, while they may be able to put a lot more, you know, oil barrels into, into the market and get more product, uh, more product into the market, um, you know, what about everything else that's needed to make, you know, the cars and make the, uh, you know, refrigerators or whatever else that, 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 that China's, uh, manufacturing? Um, you know, so opening, uh, opening up, uh, you know, oil and making it significantly cheap uh may be sort of counterproductive in terms of jamming up the uh, supply chains. Nitesh, I would like to thank you for uh, the very clear macro and most, most particularly commodities elaboration that we've heard here on the show from you. The trade idea is very clear. I think it's one of these where you can't miss where the big picture here is, which is to be long oil at the end of the day uh, from your end. Um, one last question from my end is if people want to know more about Nitesh and where to find your work, when can, where can they do that? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so we publish our research regularly on our, on our website. So that's, uh, www. Uh, www.wisdomtree.eu. Um, so if you go onto our website, um, you'll have to sort of, there's a few buttons you have to click, you know, really a professional or, or, you know, uh, or, or a retail investor. But if you head towards our insights part of our website, um, that's where you'll free find most of our research. We write blogs, we write the uh, larger form, uh, uh, papers. Uh, we also have something called the commodity monthly monitor where we look at all the commodity relevant data and uh, provide uh, some uh, a macro overlay of uh, an interpretation of what's happened in, in the prior month. Um, there's lots of uh, uh, material up there. Um, and also you can find me uh, on Twitter as well. Um, on uh, Nitesh uh, WTE um, is my sort of handle. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's where you find most of our material. Nitesh Shah, the Head of Commodity and Macroeconomic Research at Wisdom Tree. Thank you very much for being with us. It was a pleasure. You're most welcome. So back to the show without the guest, Andreas. So now we can talk behind Nitesh's back on his macro trade idea and uh, thesis. Just joking, but it's the 5th of January, 2023, and uh, Nitesh Shah, which is the uh, head of commodities and macro research at Wisdom Tree, came on the show and basically put up a trade idea, which is to be long energy, more precisely long oil, be it Brent or WTI, doesn't really matter. Um, he also elaborated a bit on why does he think both short term, but also relatively medium term, he thinks that's a good idea. And I see you extremely upset about the trade, Andrea. So can you please blubber on why don't you like it? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm needing short energy. I think that's, ah, that's, it. <laughs> that's why. Um, but I, I, I get the supply story. Uh, it is evidently tight. Uh, also, if you look at it from a historical uh, context, but what I dislike about the idea of being long oil right now is that I find it very feasible that China will try and contain oil pressures as a consequence of the reopening. So allow me to elaborate why that is before I get to some data backing up my thesis. First of all, if China reopens during the first half of the year, they will either, first of all, use their strategic petroleum reserve to ensure that the oil demand 
is not growing in a way that supply cannot cope with. I think that's a likely scenario. They've done that before in other instances where the economic growth rebounded. Um, so they have an SPR completely similar to the uh, to the US SPR, of course. They could use that. Secondly, I don't buy the idea that Russia can push through a cut to the supply in OPEC because right now Russia is in the pocket of China when it comes to trades, right? Uh, it is the only client outside of India of any significant size. So why on earth would they try to upset China at a time where China needs the oil because of the reopening? I simply don't get it from a geopolitical standpoint. Uh, so uh, given the um, sort of relationship between China and Russia and how it's played out as, as a consequence of Russia's lack of a relationship with the West, I simply doubt that OPEC um, is willing to cut production to the extent needed to bring up oil prices again. So um, I doubt that the supply story is as negative as it is depicted by many, uh, because it is certainly a consensus view that energy will perform again. Uh, and that's also a reason to be a bit skeptical about it, maybe. Uh, but this is, of course, a tactical discussion. Uh, I think a lot of what Nitesh very brilliantly elaborated on when it comes to the medium to long term story is absolutely true. Uh, so. Uh, and he, he was obviously spot on in terms of how you use various uh, energy resources in various parts of the supply chain. So I'm, I'm not talking against his thesis. I'm talking against the short term tactical outlook uh, as a consequence of my geopolitical analysis on, um, on, um, on China. But the second thing that's important is to consider what happens empirically when China reopens. If you look at the relationship between the Li Qigang index, so the uh, Chinese activity monitor, relative to various categories in the commodity complex. It is very evident that China is more closely correlated to industrial metals than energy, mm -hmm. likely as a consequence of China oftentimes using the SPR when they rebound right. growth-wise. So in my view, it's a more clear-cut case to bet on copper, for example, if you want to bet on that Chinese reopening. Uh, and um, if you have the ability to implement it, then a spread trade being long metals versus being short energy is, in my view, the perfect way to express it. So that I, was my uh, rant. So let me, let me make a couple of comments on this. So um, from a long-term perspective, um, the role of commodities, industrial energy, metals, especially in a portfolio, clearly has some merits here. And we talked about this with Warren Pies as well in one of our, our previous podcasts where he talked about the properties that these commodities can have in the portfolio in inflationary times, especially stagflationary times where real growth isn't really picking up on a momentum basis, but there are inflationary pressures. Then commodities can do very well. Of course, there were none of this period in the rest of the last four decades, almost none. And that's why commodities in general weren't a great asset to have, but there might be few more of these periods going ahead. But that's a long-term asset allocation property. Here we're talking about a three, three to six months trade. Now, one thing that I would like to notice there is that um, apparently the Chinese have stockpiled commodities a bit before the opening. Of course, they knew they would have caved in to the request from people a bit earlier than they told us they would have caved in at the end of the day, right? They, they decide whether yes or no. And that is pretty also evident from a couple of interesting relationships I'm seeing here on my, on my volatility adjusted market dashboard. I mean, on a volatility adjusted um, basis, I'm looking at copper basically unchanged on a two weeks basis. Um, and then I'm looking at the renminbi rallying two standard deviations. I'm looking at Chinese equities rallying further, Australia, Korea, all of that reacting. So it seems there is one complex of the market, which is the China reopening is going to lead to higher nominal growth, higher demand, higher kind of things. Commodities aren't reacting to that. So the elasticity seems to be hampered, as you said, by the fact that the Chinese have reserves. They have stockpiled and they can use these reserves to service short term needs rather than shooting themselves in the feet by asking for more of this stuff from the outside and therefore boosting prices and therefore running an inflationary spiral, a domestic inflationary spiral. And don't forget, Andreas, that what the, the biggest asset of the, um, of the Chinese Communist Party, I think, is their ability to keep 
social cohesion of some sort within China. If they lose that, if they lose that social stability, it's, it's over. And um, you know, an inflationary spiral and um, input prices up and commodity prices up in China in renminbi terms, it's not a great idea at this stage. So I agree with you. Geopolitically, there is no incentive from China to feed this potential f uh, fire, I think, and they have stockpiled ahead. So I think that's not a great reason why to be long taken in isolation. Yeah, um, and let's remind people that if you want to bet on the long oil story that Nitesh Shah brilliantly laid out, also with a long-term perspective, the ETF to use is CRUD, Wisdom Tree WT, uh, WTI Crude Oil. Uh, that's at least a very clear and, um, and, and precise uh, expression of his view. Um, and it's tradable in Europe, um, it's also in the UK. Uh, and it's uh, basically passported throughout the uh, almost throughout the European Union. Uh, if you're in the US, you need to find another way to express it, uh, but um, pretty easy to find ETFs um, reflecting long oil. Um, that was the reflection of the trade. What I wanted to add um, is that it's very tricky to find positioning sparing partners that are not long energy right now. Um, and it's also evident in various surveys uh, gauging positioning that, uh, at least in equity space, we for once see a positive lean in the positioning in the energy space. Uh, and I get why, given that it was the only sector more or less performing last year. Um, but when we get to such extreme position, extremes positioning wise, and when you cannot find anyone speaking against the trade, it's, it's usually a time where you at least need to consider whether um, the trade will work in relative terms to other trades. Uh, and final thing I wanted to add in that uh, regards, and it's uh, almost a story tying everything together when it comes to uh, base metals, uh, industrial metals, and the energy complex. I think the main beneficiary of the complete meltdown in Tesla is China. Uh, because if you look at data on the amount of electric vehicles sold by other companies than Tesla over the past course of the uh, of the November December uh, quarter. It's actually evident now that China is the geography growing in electric vehicle terms, uh, and they're gaining market shares relative to Tesla. So, build your dreams is an example of that. Um, and therefore, if the Tesla meltdown continues and um, if Tesla is certainly out of fashion also when it comes to demand, I actually think that it's a demand booster for Chinese vehicles. Yeah, that's uh, an interesting angle that I didn't think about. But this Chinese reopening is one, one thing to close up the, uh, the outro session talking about China and commodities. I've tweeted it yesterday, but I hear a lot of people telling me that the Chinese reopening is priced in. I uh, really appreciate that angle because I have never experienced a full reopening from literally almost complete shutdown of the second largest economy in the world with stimulus on top of it done domestically from China. So without the same, uh, how can I say, stop and go kind of policies that the West was a bit forced to apply during during COVID reopenings. I mean, we have had some examples. We have had a roadmap of how in the US and in Europe that could work. And after a week or two, assuming that all will be priced in, I think it's perhaps a bit premature. Of course, now the rally is extending. So at some point we'll take a break. Uh, things don't go up in a straight line. But from a um, social stability perspective, I think China is going for it. And obviously there, it will not be a straight line, but they are going for it. Yeah, I guess it doesn't compare fully, obviously, to the reopening of Europe and the US, since the amount of stimulus as a percent of GDP is smaller yeah. in China. But in any case, in hindsight, who would have guessed that Justin Bieber bought an ape picture for more than $1 million <laughs> when, when the US reopened, right? I mean, it, it was part of the reopening mayhem, right? Of course. And, of course. and, 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 and I wouldn't rule out that China reopening could be a, a material black swan in a positive sense. I mean, why rule it out before we see the consequences? No, 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 absolutely. But don't forget, Andreas, that uh, the Federal Reserve minutes yesterday uh, reminded us that as long as people think about opening open sea websites and trading JPEGs and stuff like that, 
Jay Powell and his crew are going to keep going. So please, guys, do not buy JPEGs anymore uh, and trade them with each other because otherwise Powell is going to raise, raise rates to 8% and we don't want that. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, and I have a mortgage to pay, so please don't. <laughs> but, uh, I, I, I tweeted yesterday that um, the price of that board monkey picture that Justin Bieber bought is now $69,000. So we have $69,000 left before the end of the Fed hiking cycle. <laughs> I, I, I tend to agree with this assessment. All right, enough with the crap. Uh, thanks, guys, for listening, as always. And um, goodbye from uh, Alf here. Yeah, but Alf, let's yeah. remind yeah. people of one thing. Um, Stenoresearch.com ah, yeah. is now live. Um, so you can go check us out. Um, and secondly, um, I would also like to highlight, since we talk about energy today, that I have launched the Energy Cable at Substack together with our friend Warren Pice. We will look into energy trends in the US and Asia and in Europe on a weekly basis. And it's uh, behind a very affordable pay, uh, paywall. So the Energy Cable at Substack or stenoresearch.com. See Some right shameless here. plug from my friend <laughs> Steno, but that's totally fine. At this point, I'm going to do, the, do it as well. Uh, we just released the macro ETF portfolios for 2023 at themacrocompass.com. Our interactive tools are live. I think quite good feedback so far, and I'm very proud of them. We're going to keep adding them. So if you want to check out what the offers are, themacrocompass.com is the website. Said that, enough with the shameless plugs. And now this time, really, this is goodbye from Alf. And this is goodbye from Andreas Dino. See you next Sunday.